So yes, yeah, so welcome to our, our second session, uh, entitled Profitable Farming Systems. So this, sis, this session will ask the question, is it possible to be profitable whilst caring for the environment? Can we, can we have both? Can we achieve both things together? Or does it have to be a compromise? So I'm very pleased and delighted to be joined by a number of speakers um, or panellists for this session. To my immediate right, uh, to your left, um, is, um, is Edward Hosking. Um, Edward's an organic beef farmer um, from down near, what, you describe yourself, St. Burian direction? Yeah. yeah, happy to be associated. Le Morna. Le <laughs> um, So managing 110 uh, stabiliser suckler cows on an organic um, forage-based system. So Edward will, will tell us about, about that and how he's... Uh, making a profit whilst caring for the environment. Um, to my far right and to your far left is Sam Stevens. Sam works for Southern England Farms uh, as an agronomist, and he's going to chat to us about what they're doing to support the sustainability and profitability of their business. To my then left and to your right is uh, David Hitchin. And David is a tenant on the Blythe Estate um, and recently converted a, f a beef and about arable farm there to dairy and manages a spring block calving herd there. And then to my far left and to your far right is Lisa Guy. And uh, Lisa Guy manages an organic farm, um, organic beef farm. There's also planted a number of trees and has a, few, a range of diversification options. Her grazing extends up into the downs. So I hope you'll um, yeah, enjoy this session. Please think of your questions as we go through. And um, I'll hand over now to Edward to uh, kick us off um, with his introduction. <clears throat> Morning, all. Um, yeah, I hope you can all hear me. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Ed Hosking. We farm in partnership with my parents out near St. Burian. Um, currently farming 230 acres, um, 160 of which is owned, and the remaining is, uh, yeah, rented on FBTs. Um, we've been organic now for the last 16 years. Probably went organic for the money. Uh, not for the money, uh, for the, yeah, well, it was for the money, for the conversion. Um, sorry, first time I'm doing this sort of thing, so a bit nerve-wracking. Um, yeah, so went organic for the money and have ended up very much enjoying the organic principles and the organic sort of way of thinking. Um, it's a challenge, but I think everyone quite likes the challenge, really. Um, yeah, so we've got no, no bought-in feed or concentrates on the farm. Everything is produced on farm. Um, through uh, peas and barley, um, done as crimp or whole crop. Um, so yeah, similarly to Mike, uh, really, which he did a very good job of explaining it far better than I will. Um, so yeah, we're, we've been using multi-species swords uh, based around chicory and plantain now for about eight years um, alongside paddock grazing. Um, I went to New Zealand in 2015 and had my eyes opened um, considerably. So I came home and uh, yeah, started bullying my father to try and change things, which thankfully I don't think he wa it was a walkover, which obviously meant that what I was doing I was passionate about and believed in. Um, so we got there in the end. Um, so we have 110 stabilizer suckler cows, um, all calving in 10 weeks, uh, starting on the 14th of February. Um, so that's going to be quite busy, alongside the fact that mum, my dad and myself all have jobs off farm. Um, so, yeah, it could be a bit of a, a busy time. Uh, yeah, they sca scanned in calf at 95% uh, in calf rate in 10 weeks. Um, I think 53 of that is in the first three weeks. So hopefully we'll pay for a dry, dry period. Then, um, yeah, with an emphasis on easy calving, vigorous calves that get up and go, we had a smaller South Devon herd um, probably 10 years ago and struggled with big dopey calves. Um, I seem to be the one that has to put the calves to suck, so I thought we could try and make a change from that because it's not that much fun. It's all right for what, the old one, but I don't think anyone likes doing it more than they have to. Uh, all fat cattle are aimed to be sold at 24 months old, um, all sold as breeding replacements to other farms. Um, it's a case of having to be, really. Um, I know, obviously, you, can, you know, get everyone say well, weight, weight pays, but I think as far as our business model is concerned, um, yeah, them going at 24 months, the next calves are on their way, so they've got to be gone um, to make room. Um, 
the dead weight average, I think, currently is running about 355 um, dead, and they are, well, yeah, averaging about 18 months at the moment, um, but obviously there's about 30, 35 left to go between now and sort of the middle of Feb. Um, we recently adopted um, yeah, shallow tillage um, system at home. We had a grant from the uh, ANOB in a protective um, farming and protective landscapes grant and uh, purchased a disc, um, a set of discs with a cedar unit on it to um, do our sort of kale and multi-species swords. With that, we're reducing, um, yeah, reducing uh, inversion and obviously loss of soil organic matter. Um, the farm is split in five sites, all split by roads, um, which makes managing it a bit of a headache. Um, so if you ever see cattle on the loose out near us, that's probably us moving cows. Um, if there's anyone, not anyone following it, please give me a ring. Um, we found getting hold of land quite difficult, especially being a smaller farm. Um, as, well, yeah, especially being a smaller farm and having to um, you compete. I'm sorry to pick on you, Sam, but uh, <laughs> compete with the larger growers um, and high rents. Um, so we have purchased quite a lot of our own land or extra land in the last 12 years um, just to put, well, it's got our name on it so we can do what we want with it. Um, but, yeah, getting, getting hold of land has been very difficult. The subletting within the area or Cornwall as a whole does make it a challenge, um, especially for the smaller family farm, I think. Um, but uh, perhaps things are on a change with you know, events like today. Um, I don't think I've got anything else to say. Thank you. No, thank you for that, Ed, and I'll hand over to Sam now um, to introduce himself. Good morning, all. Um, I've worked at Southern England Farms since around 2015. It's only really the last five to six years that we've looked at going down this more sustainable route through strip, strip tillage. And funnily enough, a chap from Australia, which I think a few of you would have come to, Graham Sake, came over, and he really sort of opened our eyes to um, this aspect of farming. Um, so a bit about the company. Southern England Farms grows around 6,000 acres a year of mainly brassicas with a few cucurbits, courgettes, um, spread all throughout Cornwall. Um, we've literally spread from Padstow all the way across to Port Elliot, down St. Burian, which um, enables us to take full advantages of the microclimates that run throughout the county. Um, it also brings its challenges. We find throughout the county, obviously, there's completely different soil types, from heavy clays in some parts down to the sandier stuff on your north coast around Padstow and around your Hale estuary. Um, where appropriate, um, like I said, the last five or six years, we've been using strip till. Um, don't get me wrong, we're still using the plough and other cultivation methods where it suits us. Um, we found that you can't so wholeheartedly go down the strip till route. I know that some are, but it doesn't really suit us with all crops. Um, on our longer term ground, we have been using um, cover crops, similarly for the last five or six years. And we've found these have made a massive difference to soil organic matter levels and also our P's and K's and our mineralizable nitrogen, um, which, with the help of Charles and the Green Waste Company and their compost, we have been seeing our organic matter levels on these long-term land go up through the roof. Um, on our shorter-term land... Um, we're generally seen as a break crop for a lot of cereal growers. Um, so we're sort of in there and out in a short space of time. This doesn't mean that we're still not using these systems. All of our overwinter cabbage has all been stripped till this year for the first time. And generally, overall, it has been our highest yielding year to date, I think. And we had a particularly good Christmas this year with the cauliflower front. Um, on our look back to our longer term ground, 
Um, we've seen a massive reduction in the amount of fertiliser we're using. Again, we've reduced it similar to what Mike was saying. We dropped it by 100 kilos a hectare in some places, and we're possibly looking into doing something similar again. Um, also, our headland management, we've changed a lot of that as well. We've got bigger headlands, and we're leaving a lot of headlands drilled um, just to prevent that soil runoff and try and manage it better because it's obviously becoming more and more of an issue and more widely recognised than it was. Um, also, we're, we're losing a lot of chemistry, generally, whether it comes to pest management, herbicides, and going down the strip-till route is becoming more and more fashionable and aiding us in this management, really. Um, soil analysis-wise, we're um, using, well, it's a Hutchinson's-based company, Sustainable Soil Management, which, again is measuring everything from your P's and K's, your pH's, to your organic matter and the carbon within the soil. And we've adjusted our fertiliser rates to that. Um, yeah, Our main cover crop mixes, we're using black oats and vetches, buckwheat, which has generally got away on the earlier drillings fairly well. Um, for Celia, and some clovers. Uh, for the first time also this year, we're, we've got uh, about 30 acres down to clover lay, which we're going to attempt to strip till straight into. So that should be interesting. So, yeah, that's an outline of what we're doing anyway. Cool. Okay. Awesome, thank you, Sam. And I'll hand over to David. Thanks, James. Uh, I'm David. I've um, just completed my second year milking on a um, on a tenancy, like you said. Um, I run 200 uh, cows on a spring block calving system. I've chosen to be a flying herd um, so that I can milk as many cows as possible while we get going. Um, and yeah, I'm just a couple of miles away from here on a farm. Many of you will know. Um, my core um, FBT is 50 hectares, so 125 acres, and I farm a further 50 hectares or a further 125 acres on various um, shorter term lets and licenses, but luckily all uh, local, to, you know, very local to me in terms, I can't graze it all, but um, fairly local. Um, in terms of, you know, can we turn a profit and be environmentally sound? Well, I guess. One of, the, one of the big wins, I think, for the system that I farm is we are all um, permanent grass. I mean, a lot of that is, is planted new lays, but it's 100% grass. Um, we grow, you know, I, I'm at the moment growing a small amount of forage crop as a way of reseeding, but, um, you know, to all intent and purpose, it's an all-grass system. It's grazed grass and rain bale grass silage laid on the farm. So hopefully that ticks some boxes um, from what we've heard from the, the first session in terms of um, there being no tillage, 100% ground cover all of the time, and hopefully that, that grass crop with lots of grazing is also you know, dropping those, the leaves off the plant that are then um, helping to improve our organic matter as well as what the cows are leaving behind. Um, I guess you know, maybe the most interesting thing about, about what we d we're doing is that we're fairly new, um, you know, and I'd, I'd like to, to see more you know, younger people more um, getting into farming in our area and, and more turnover of land. And uh, that's a challenge in agriculture everywhere in the UK is the kind of turnover of the people as, um, as farmers want to retire and, or, you know, and, and success is coming in. Um, the, the challenges surrounding that have been um, you know, finance to get going, um, definitely planning. Um, getting planning permission for the infrastructure we need, um, land, as Ed has said, and I'm a you know I'm a bit of a believer that in order to be environmentally sound and to turn a profit, we do need some scale, and that can be a, a challenge in our area. As Ed said, their farm is split into lots of little blocks. Um, the trouble is, it's particularly in dairying, there are some economies of scale, I believe. So although 
our area isn't suited to milking 500 cows, and I don't think you need to milk 500 cows in our area. You do need enough to be able to put a parlour in, hopefully pay someone to do some milking so you can have some work-life balance. You still need to buy a tractor, and there's still lots of other items you need, whether you're going to milk 10 cows or 200 cows. So you need some economies of scale. And in order to milk, uh, you know, in my situation, in order to have that mass of, of business to get going, you need enough land unless you're going to farm really intensively. So I think that's an interesting argument, you know, regards scale versus intensity and the environment as well. Um, as we're using carbon footprint as a measure of sustainability a lot of the time, and interestingly in dairy production, the more intensively we farm, often the lower our carbon footprint is because we're producing more litres for the same input. But is that really the route we want to go down, especially in our landscape? I'd much rather see us farming more extensively with less cows per hectare, more cows out in fields doing what they should be doing. Um, a lot of getting going, there's been a lot of um, things surrounding people to get right. Um, attracting staff in our area is difficult, um, despite all the nice beaches and the things we love about Cornwall, people, getting people to move here to work is difficult, whether you're a local farmer or the NHS. Um, you know, unless there's something really good, why would people want to be several hours away from you know, the, where they grew up or their family or their friends? And that's difficult to, to relocate people. So I think we need to utilise the people we've already got. There's a lot of people who want to live in Cornwall that grew up here and don't want to move anywhere, but they're not necessarily skilled farmers. So I've tried to keep things simple so I can utilise the people that are already here. Um, the, the three um, sort of part-time people I've had helping us on the farm so far have all been relatively young, relatively green, relatively new to it. And um, if we can th keep things simple enough, then, you know, throughout times of the year, they can still do all the tasks on the farm without too much training. They don't need to be able to operate, you know, lots of, um, you know, complicated um, kit or anything like that. Um, the other people issue is the relationships on the farm. So in order to, to get in, I had to obviously liaise with um, my land, my landlord, um, some existing tenants who were currently exiting um, the farm and the land and the land surrounding me. And, and I've got to keep on with those relationships to try and the people I now rent land off, I have to manage the relationships with them. So it is, yeah, all about um, managing those relationships. Um, and in terms of, um, yeah, I'm definitely not organic at the moment. I rely far too much um, on imported fertilizer and a bit of imported feed. Like I say, that's partly about um, getting some scale, getting some production to get going. Um, in the future, I, I definitely would like to be less intensive, rely less on fertilizer. And I've got a little bit of herbal laying, but not much. Um, and like I say, that's, it's all, um, it's all a work in progress, really, and like I say, I think um, you know, I would keep beating the drum. Really, we do need, if we want to farm extensively, we need a bit. We need to be able to spread ourselves across that acreage, um, use the organic manures that we produce better across all of those acres as well. Um, my current issue is is uh, one of big problem is slurry storage, so we can store that nutrient effectively and then use it more effectively as well. So. Yeah, these are all some of the some of the challenges. I'll leave it there, and hopefully, we've got plenty of time for questions. Excellent, thank you, David. You touched on a broad range of issues there. I'm sure we'll come come back to some of those shortly. And I'll just hand over to Lisa Guy. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, James. Um, I was hoping to stay sat, but everyone else has stood up, so I feel I ought to do the same. Um, I'm Lisa Guy. I have a small farm, much smaller than any of these guys' farms, on the north coast. Um, my background is I went to Silhain College, and there's a few of us in this room today, which is really nice. I um, hope to catch up with you at some point. Um, and I studied a degree in agriculture and countryside management. Um, I'm really grateful for the countryside management aspect of my degree because it touched on, not enough, but it touched on ecology and landscape management, which I've actually found to be incredibly useful with my time on the farm, especially in the last sort of 10, 15 years. So back to our farm, we've got a small farm on the north coast 
and it's we've got 50 acres of permanent uh, grassland, some of which is rough acid grassland, um, some is down to herbal lays, and the rest is generally permanent pasture with a fair amount of mixed species content. Um, we've also got about six to seven acres of planted, established, and coppiced woodland. And we've also got 60 acres of ver uh, various habitats, so 40 acres up on high downs of uh, moorland. We've got an area of wetland, an area of uh, wet woodland scrub. So it's quite a diverse but small farm. So overall, there's 120 acres, but less than half of that is um, down to um, grassland. Um, from the start, when we moved in, we realized with such a small farm, it was going to be difficult to make a, a large profit from it. Or So we decided right from the start to diversify our income on and off the farm. Um, so my husband um, developed a career in renewables and I managed the farm alongside having children and, and bringing them up. We decided to carry on the beef suckler system that was on the farm, but we decided to go into South Devons initially um, because surprisingly the land over on that north coast, we've got deep soils and we could finish the South Devons very successfully. Um, from the start, this was all sold directly, with the odd one being sold to the Harvey Brothers in St. Just. Um, and I developed a beef box system from the outset because I knew, again, our margins are tight. I needed to maximise on that margin, and direct sale was the best way to do that. Um, so it's, we've sort of evolved the farm over the years. So the first... The first sort of impetus, I suppose, was getting the lamb back into good fettle and a bit of diversity, um, developing our beef box system, diversifying our income, and just keeping our system really low input, which was another key aspect of getting that margin. So being organic, we didn't have any high fertilizer costs. Um, we also use a lot of homeopathy, so I don't worm our cows. We don't generally supply mineral licks. Um, and if my cows are in need of some health input, I go to homeopathy first. And generally, that tends to work for us. So we work within, the farm works within its own environment. We don't have any expensive inputs from imported feeds. And that's also very useful and especially more important today, where a lot of our imported feeds may well be coming from halfway across the world, and so the carbon footprint on that is really high. Um, so that's more of the background. I suppose um, in the last 10, 15 years, once my children had got a bit older and I had a bit more time to start thinking how we were going to look at progressing what we were doing on the farm, we started to look much more closely at the envir environmental benefits that we were doing on the farm. And I just felt, we all felt we could do a lot better. Um, so I was looking across our landscape, and this is where the ecology and the landscape um, understanding comes into play, and started to realize that although we live in a very beautiful area, um, it's very wild and it's very it's exposed, it is actually quite denuded. And I realized that, you know, there was a loss of hedgerows and scrubby areas and bits of woodland. So 15 years ago, um, because it's a low input system, I had more time to invest in planting hedgerows and some areas of woodland and focusing in particular on coppice woodland because it's a, a willow coppice is a short term rotation. So you're locking down carbon quite quickly and you get a good return in, in the form of wood fuel. So we're um, completely self-sufficient in wood fuel and also in potential sales of that for all sorts of things. Everyone wants willow these days for living willow sculptures, basketry, and planting themselves for shelter belts. So that was a good thing to do. Um, 
We also changed our breed of cows, so it sort of evolved. Um, so we moved from South Devons, and as much as I loved our South Devons, they are big cows, and they have a heavy footfall. And I wanted to start grazing a lot more of that 120 acres that we had under our management. So I'd initially started exploring that with ponies and horses, which is great, but as we all probably know, they're slightly different grazier. And um, I also thought, with regards to our beef business, a lot more people were really keen to, um, they were very, really interested. There's a real shift in um, market mentality, really, whereby a lot more people were interested in how we were farming. And so that really sort of stimulated me to sort of think, OK, I'm going to move from South Devons, and I'm going to go for our, from our largest native breed to our smallest native breed, the Dexter, which often gets quite a few laughs from other farmers and things like that. You know, it's, why are you bothering? They're so small. But actually, for our farm, our small farm, and for what we were trying to achieve, it was a good fit. We also wanted to support that mentality that it's less is more. You know, uh, the quality of our beef is really good. It's not about how much beef you meet, you're eating, it's about what sort of beef you're eating and the system it comes from. And the Dexter's fitted that, so we were able very much to start grazing our moorlands. Um, they run through some wet meadows, they run through some wet woodland, and that, that's also increased that opportunity to medicinally graze, which has also enabled me to keep my other inputs down as well. Um, thank you. I was just around a wrap up. That's great. <laughs> um, so yes, I think we've evolved, but we've always kept to a low input system, direct sale, and we've just tweaked that and looked to how best we can diversify more and get a better profit for our beef. And I think the going down the more environmental farming with nature has definitely helped us to reduce our costs, but also gain more market. Thank you. Thank you. OK, thank you, Lisa. So we'll open up for questions, um, and I'll let the mic come out into the room so you can, you can ask them. Um, can we have the table mics on? Um, what was I got at the back? Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, we'll use the table mics on. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I have a question for Sam. Um, with your minimal till, um, does that um, is it summer crops that normally are done minimal till, or is it your winter crops? Um, it's dependent, really, on the farm and the conditions that we're going into. Um, we've noticed during dry conditions, strip tilling, that you're seeing a lot more drought within the crop on certain farms. But again, that falls back to the organic matter levels within the farm. So we're sort of going on farm, looking at the soil analysis, what the fields are like, the topography of the ground, the soil types, and we're making our decisions from there, really. Um, winter cropping, with the higher rainfall, we generally see less of an issue. Do you have a rule of thumb, Sam, with regards to um, what organic matter you'd look at to think it's safe to um, strip till, especially in the summer? A, a lot of it is going back historically onto the farm as well. Um, so where we're following a livestock farm, we would generally strip till. Um, however, old permanent pasture lays are sort of a no-go for us when it comes to strip tillage. There's too much trash, and you see that in the crop afterwards as well, similar to what Ryan was showing. Um, yeah. It's just okay, thank you. Um, anyone else with a question? Just, oh yeah. Yeah, I guess, you know, it's probably to all the panellists, really, but it's just struck me that, you know, we've got two, two young lads who, um, you know, keen to get into farm or keen on the farming, um, potentially um, hungry for land um, and are restricted by the availability of land, another business that's um, operating 6,000 acres. Um, could the, and, you know, looking at profitable farming systems here where livestock really should be part of that, I'd say, in our environment. Um, I suppose, to Sam principally, do you think that a business like yours could somehow look to incorporate 
um, the livestock within the system somehow, you know, s some kind of um, arrangement where, you know, there could be some potentially winter grazing or, or forage crops incorporated, you know, that would balance. Yeah, well, we generally work with the farmers as to what they want to a certain degree, as to when they want us on the farm. And, of course, there's obviously grazing there afterwards, potentially, following the cauliflower and following cabbage. Um, but, yeah, it's, we're tenants at the end of the day for a short period of time. So the farmer can say to us what he wants, and we're at their beck and call to a certain extent. I think we saw in the, um, as we saw in the first presentation, there's a, there's a risk of a degree of short-termism, isn't there, with, with soil health? Um, they always say cash is king. And I think when it comes to true soil health, it takes more than just one year. So hopefully we maybe see ourselves entering a period of time where people are willing to take the three to five to ten year view. And um, you know, the rotation has an opportunity to become more diverse where um, Sam can both be a tenant as can Ed. And the rotation can be extended to have a period of livestock grazing for the good of the, the true asset value of the soil. If, if, if you have land, your true value is by the fertility of your soil, not by the area you own. And I think over the past few decades, we've come aware, away from that fact and from that realisation. Um, people think of themselves how much area do they have, not how fertile their soils are. And with the cost of inputs where they are now, true profitability is derived from fertile soils, not from area of farm or area farmed. Um, Ed, so, I know you've sorry. perhaps grazed some of those... Um, on that, on that James, I... There isn't enough mixed farming in Cornwall anymore. We've lost a lot of small farms and it's being taken up by a lot of companies like ourselves, not through our own fault. But yeah, mixed farming has been in decline and hopefully with the way everything's going now, it, it, it will come back. Okay, um, Ed and David and maybe Lisa, do you like to comment on um, what you guys would need or like to see if you were to be involved in you know, rotation like um, South England farmers or, or any of other growers in the region? Uh, yeah, I agree. It's something we should definitely look at doing, trying to work with arable growers to, you know, to work with them and enter into their rotation maybe. Um, the challenges for me would be um, obviously being in milk production. I, most of the time I need my cows to be able to graze and then walk to a parlour. Um, in some of the other counties in England, they've solved that problem with mobile parlours but you need huge tracts of land for that to work, really, to be able to move a parlour around. Um, so that's maybe not one for our area. And the other challenge, of course, is fencing water. Um, so though that's the challenge if we're going to move the animals onto the potentially vegetable land or whatever it is. Um, possibly cover crops could be harvested and delivered to, to livestock farms. But again, we're, mo we're moving nutrient around and possibly taking it from where it's needed and taking it to me where I probably don't need it so much because I've got the livestock. So probably moving the cows to the arable land is what we need to do. Maybe things like virtual fencing are going to help with that because you don't have to invest so much in um, in, in permanent fencing. Um, and I guess, yeah, if someone was willing to, to work together, then we'd have to maybe invest in mobile water bowsers and stuff like that just to make it, make it easy. And, and like Sam said, the challenge is you can't invest that much in fencing and water um, if you're only there for a, for, a, for a short time. So I guess it's taking a longer term view, looking at what we would need and, and trying to just yeah, work through those challenges. And maybe the time is now um, in the past, we've come up against those barriers and gone, well, that's going to be quite difficult, so we'll get it from a bag. Whereas the time, you know, things are changing as it becomes more difficult to get it from a bag um, any sort of energy is now costing so much money, perhaps, yeah, we, start, you know, we need to re-look at those things and look at how we can work through, the, through those challenges to make something work. Um, Ed, would you like to comment? Um, sorry, I think I've got to get quite close to this. Um, yeah, I think probably certainly, is, you know, on a, on a beef system, the turnover of money is considerably smaller than the likes of dairy. Um, and taking on land on such a short... Um, you know, period of time and having the cost to regrass it and fence it and essentially do all the do all the donkey work to put the soil structure back into the right sort of plane or increasing organic matter to then be not taken away again, but obviously someone else have the benefit. It's quite a cost involved in it. Um, so obviously, whether 
the the um, yeah, it's more symbiotic in the fact that the the grower would perhaps regrass the land, and then you take on you know do the donkey work essentially not for free, but for a certainly low, a lower rate than what would normally be typically sort of given. I think it's a wonderful opportunity, isn't it? The economics of the job have changed very quickly in the last 12 months. In fact, we saw um, in Ryan Kim Johnson's presentation 178 pounds a hectare of available nitrogen potentially from that cover crop. If it was grazed, I'm sure that figure would be higher. So when it comes to costs and who pays, there's a lot of opportunity there for the grazier to perhaps not even pay and to even be paid at certain times because the value they're providing is so much greater. It's just, as you, as you rightly said, David, it's something the right stock class. You've obviously got some replacement heifers and your cows are dry for part of the year mm -hmm. where they're a bit more flexible. We've got other challenges with TB and, and other things in the county, but there is potential there and perhaps the economic reason and need. If we think about environment, we've got the environment within your farm, um, also the environment within Cornwall itself, haven't we? And Cornwall has an opportunity to, to be carbon neutral, as I'm sure we'll cover later in the session, but also to provide the environment. And these cover crops, um, I was just wondering if any of you guys wanted to comment with um, your herbal lays and cover crops. You, do you see notable numbers in birds and insects and in, in biodiversity? Um, and do you think they have more of a benefit than just your livestock alone? Um, from our side of it, our, the biodiversity and insects that we're seeing following our cover crops is massive compared to when we were using, weren't using them in the past. Um, bumblebees and everything, and phacelia. And there's also trials going on with aphid control through um, stripping with um, margins and banks within our crops. Have you incorporated anything into the cover crops for the benefit of nature, or are they more soil health bias? And would you put things like sunflowers in perhaps at the right time of the year to provide a food source? Um, we have used sunflowers in some areas, but it's mainly aimed at soil health, particularly at the minute. Obviously, you are getting beneficials for the insects as well with some of the crops we're growing, particularly like your phacelias. I hate to say it, but do we need more sheep? <laughs> because, yeah, again, in other areas of the country, it's quite common for someone to turn up with a, a tra their tractor-drawn stock box, a, a quad, some fencing, and a dog with 500 ewes, and stick them on these cover crops for a couple of weeks, and then they move on. Um, and I don't know why that's not something that's ever really happened in our area. There's very few sheep. Um, that would probably be a better way to utilise... Um, what's left over from brassica crops and cover crops than, than any class of cattle, in a way. Yeah, well, on that, we have got, in the north of the county, there are people doing that and following us around already. Mm. Um, Ed, any comment for yourself, especially with regards to herbal lays or diverse pastures? Um, and I wonder if, Lisa, if you comment on your, I believe your pastures are very diverse. Um, perhaps you could comment as well as what other habitat they provide or support. Mm. Um, yeah, as well, similarly to Mike, we started off using a, a broad spe uh, spectrum multi-species sward um, and now uh, down to chicory and plantain because that's what seems to last. Um, we've noticed that, and it's everyone's you know hate, most hated weed, the dock, the incidence of docks at home obviously being organic anyway, we can't spray for them, um, but the chicory and plantain competing at depth um, for mineral and nutrient has certainly reduced the number of docks um, in the pastures. And we've noticed the dock beetle has turned up, which is a welcome sight. Um, and the cattle will eat them now because they just uh, don't, yeah, they're, they're, they're not unpalatable against the chicory plant or against the plantain plant because they're used to it. Um, yeah, so they will graze them out if they're grazed hard. Um, I think there's two things that I'd like to comment on. Um, one is, I think, when you have herbal lays as part of your grazing regime on the farm, you've got a much more, a greater ability of creating much more of a patchwork mosaic of slightly different habitat and slightly different um, food for invertebrates, birds, and things like that. So I think in that sense, the herbal lays, you know, are really powerful to have as a mix. Um, I think the other thing I'd say is that a few years ago we were involved in the carbon, um, soil carbon testing um, project. And although our fields were, um, Tom was saying that that 
I can't remember the chap, Label Farm had really high organic matter, uh, so did we, up, up around the 14 to 16%, which is great, but we also discovered that we had a five inch plow line through most of our fields. And, you know, it, it can be quite costly to get tractors in and use the aerators and things like that. And because we're a really low input system, we could do a bit of that. Um, but we looked at our herbal lays to do that job for us, which means we save on all the um, mechanical investment and it's, it's, you reduce the compaction and use of diesel and herbal lays will do that job really well, particularly the chicory with its deep root that is able to break down through plough lines. Cool, thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, sometimes back, back to the floor for questions. So, um, Rachel, if you don't mind, um, just lady behind you. Um, Lisa, a question for you. I, I think I'm correct in saying you've used geofencing collars? Yes. Um, how has that been? Um, so, I started trialling the no-fence collars um, three years ago. Um, Penwith Landscape Partnership were keen and it fitted our farm and, and what I was doing. So three years ago I had quite a few collars turn up at the farm and it's a little bit to get your head around because they're quite, quite big collars but actually they're no bigger than a cowbell that you might find in the Auvergne in France. Um, so once you've got your head around that, that's fine. And then I'm really not good you know, with technology. And that did concern me a bit because it's an app on your phone and it's all quite complicated. But actually, it's really well thought through, even for a, a sort of techie idiot like me. Um, so three years ago, we, we put them on our cows specifically to graze the 40 acres of higher down up at the highest bit of our land. Luckily, it's the highest bit of our land and signal was good. So the collars we realized worked really well up there. And the cows um, learnt the system within you know, a couple of days and, and really heeded it on the moor, which was quite a concern for me because we've got North Road not that far away and no fencing in between. So you know, I had to really learn to trust that system, which is quite helpful because on the app you can watch and see where your cows are at three o'clock in the morning when you just have that like, oh, where are they? Um, and they were always within the 40-acre 40 40 acre block. I've started to graze them successfully up there twice a year for between two and four weeks, which really takes the pressure off our inland pasture. And might increase that. It's very much, a you, you know, you look and see, you observe, you watch your cows out there, you see what the um, moorland is looking like, what it would benefit from. And yeah, but it's, a, I think it's a really fantastic tool. It's, um, it's enabled me to get the cows out on that 40 acre moorland in a way that I put ponies out there occasionally behind electric fencing. It was a pain in the ass. It's just too time consuming. And again, when you're a low input system, you need, you know, technology that's going to help you do things simply and not consume a huge amount of time. Cool. Thank you, Lisa. There was a question at the back, I believe. Okay, so I'm not sure the mic's working at the back, but um, the panellists, could you comment, um, perhaps just Lisa, David and Ed, to, to comment, um, you know, how are they, you know, are, are, do you consider yourselves profitable, and um, maybe what have you done you think is key to your profitability um, on a family farm? Um, certainly, in, um, in our aspect, um, the fact that we have tried to keep the farming system as simple as possible. Um, so that we can all work off-farm for external income has allowed any, any profit made on the farm to be either reinvested um, or, yeah, retained and reinvested and, you know, either outside of the farm or inside of the farm or, you know, even, God forbid, taking a wage as a farmer. Um, 
I think that's quite key. Um, I think we can all overcomplicate things. Um, I think we're probably guilty of that anyway. But um, yeah, we're probably far too over, overly mechanised. Um, but it does mean that after you know, in in two hours in the morning, Dad and I can feed and see 250 head of cattle and be at work by nine. Um, so I think that's it's it's not something I want to do forever, but um, it certainly has allowed us to jump forward in the last sort of ten years. Um, yeah, well, I'm sort of my business is in its infancy really, so any um, profit is being poured in for into infrastructure and kind of future proofing the business, um, but. You know, dairy farming in our area done right can be very profitable at the moment. Um, our costs have increased hugely, but we're quite lucky that um, you know the two major milk buyers in our area have kept pace with milk price. Um, the ratio of um, you know concentrate feed versus milk price is better than it's been for a long, long time. Um, so the a lot of the high input dairies are doing well this year as well. Um, Fertilizer has gone through the roof. Um, but like we say, we're reducing our reliance on it. And actually, if you look at your fertilizer spend in fence per, pence per litre versus those um, milk price increases we've seen, it does still stack up if you use it correctly and efficiently. Um, so yeah, I think um, it, it's, you've got to go one or two ways, really. We've either got to look at ways to um, simplify and make more of what we've got with less inputs, less labor, less machinery. And if you can do that, there is a good profit to be made, or we go the other route and we diversify, we work off farm and we, and we do those things. Um, but both ways um, can work and, and, and both, there are people doing, going down both options and making them work very profitably for them in our area. So. Sure. Um, Lisa, very briefly, if you'd like to come on. Okay. Um, oh, I've had a brain block, sorry. Um, so Profit. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, so <laughs> our beef box uh, business provides us with an important income. Um, and I think the key, the key thing to its success has been low inputs. And that is not only in money, but it also means in time. So that's meant that that's freed myself up to um, in, it sort of pursue other diversifications on the farm and for my husband to, to work off the farm. Um, and I think also it's given me time to, I mean, you know, the idea of profit is, it, obviously the monetary profit is also, is really important, but I also think we should be thinking, measuring the success of our business by all the other things that it does provide us with. So, you know, I feel my business is successful not only um, economically but it's successful because it gives me time to enjoy the farm enjoy my life and time with the children and put back into the farm in a in a way that feels really good well, excellent Lisa thank you we'll, we'll finish um, we'll finish there and just leaves me to summarize um, you know, I think the um, you know, we we can no longer see profit and environment as separate pillars and um, we should actually see them together as the same. Uh, we saw in the first session that um, you know, the, the role of organic matter and the role of soil health. So it's true to state, I think, that the, fertile, the fertility of the soil underpins the profitability of any business that works the land, whether that's dairy, sheep, beef, or, or arable. Um, our challenge going forward in the next three to five years is how do we balance the immediate cash needs of the business to service our current system, which may be more complicated and mechanized than we need, um, and how do we enable ourselves to remain cash positive whilst doing the things that are right for the environment, even if they mean short-term pain in terms of capital investment in diverse wards or in cover cropping, where the benefit may not be paid back in that same financial year. And that's a real challenge, and hopefully there'll be some support maybe from government, from policy, that will help pay for us to do the right thing. Um, it's going to take people to work together. And it's also going to take, I think, for ourselves as farmers uh, to learn a new set of skills which our forefathers or grandfathers would have had. Our grandfathers and grandmothers would have been able to look at their hay meadows and identify all of the 36 species that are in them. And now, as we plant our herbal lays, we're starting to ask ourselves, is that plantain, is that chicory? So we've lost some of these core skills, and I think Lisa touched on it um, quite successfully, that you need to better understand your environments. Where would a habitat work well, where wouldn't it? Because if you create the right habitat and we build soil fertility, pests, disease, all the things we spray for will probably disappear. 
So it's a challenge to all of us in this room. Can we remove ourselves from the vicious circle in which we've perhaps put ourselves into and, and work at how we can work with nature going forwards for our own profit and for environmental benefit as well. So can I conclude with um, a round of applause? Thank you for our, our panellists.